Hello, everybody. This is part one of a special four-part series I'll be doing over the next few days on the theology of Mary's body. We're going to look primarily to the mystery of the tilma of our Blessed Lady, Our Lady of Guadalupe, to unfold glorious mysteries about who this woman is, the theology of Mary's body. If our bodies tell a divine story, that divine story comes to complete fulfillment in the body of this woman right here. So we're going to be looking to Our Lady of Guadalupe unfolding some treasures about Mary that you've probably never heard before. This is one of the best kept secrets of Catholicism, who this woman really is. We have such a a false image of who Mary is so many times because we've grown up with a kind of hyper piety that sees Mary as a woman on a cloud. I love quoting here from, from uh, one of my favorite mystics of the 20th century, Carol Hauslander. She really sets the stage for us in an appropriate reflection on the authentic Mary. Listen to this. She says, when I was a little girl, I was told, never do anything you cannot imagine Our Lady doing. If you do, she will blush. From then on, preventing Our Lady from blushing became an obsession, Carol House Lander says, because I could not imagine Our Lady, I could only, excuse me, I could only imagine Our Lady leaning on a cloud bank or being a blue plaster statue. It was clear to me that all those things that spelled joy for me were now taboo. We have this idea of Mary as a blue plaster statue or some, some hyper pious woman leaning on a cloud bank. And if, if honoring Mary means never making her blush, as Carol Hauslander says, then that's the end of joy. That's the end of of our lives uh, with real humanity. This is the impression we have when we grow up with a hyper pious Catholic upbringing that puts Mary on a cloud. Carol Hauslander continues. She says, eventually I broke down and sobbed with boredom and despair. Such was the conception of Our Lady imposed on me by a pious upbringing. Sadly, it's a very common one. To many Catholics, Mary is unreal, and even worse, she says, unattractive. Pause, pause. If our impression of Mary is unattractive, we know not who Mary is. Mary is literally the most beautiful creature God has ever made. Mary is the crown of creation. All created beauty is summed up in her. What's your favorite beautiful thing in creation? A starlit night, a waterfall, a sunset, a full moon, uh, a beautiful bouquet of flowers, a snow peak mountaintop. That ain't nothing compared to Mary. Mary is the summation of all created beauty. <laughs> All the beauty we encounter in the created world is just a little, little glimmer of Mary's beauty. And Mary's beauty is just a little, little, little glimmer of capital B divine beauty. The whole purpose of Mary's beauty is to sum up created beauty. And the whole purpose of created beauty is to point us to uncreated beauty. So Carol Hauslander goes on. Such was the conception of Our Lady imposed on me by a pious upbringing. Sadly, it's a very common one. To many Catholics, Mary is unreal and even worse, unattractive. No wonder, for nearly all we are taught of Mary is the pious guesswork of the overly sentimental. Ha! So what we're going to be doing in this mini course over the next few days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 1 o'clock live, Eastern Time, we're going to be showing, I hope and pray, with God's grace and Mary's prayer, we're going to be showing the true beauty of Mary. We're going to be lifting a little corner of the veil to reveal the splendor, the beauty of who this woman 
really is, the theology of Mary's body. And again, we're going to be turning to the tilma in order to unfold this story. So I have my, my tilma right here. If you have an image of the tilma nearby or you can bring it up on a computer screen or something, that might help. I'll be referring to this as, as we unfold it. But I'd like to begin, this is going to frame our conversation over the next few days. I'd like to begin with a poem from Catherine of Siena. I've adapted it here. I've shortened it a little bit, but these are her words, and it will serve as the platform for our reflections. I'll read it through first, and then we'll begin unfolding it. Creator created. Mm. Creator created. She's speaking of the incarnation. Creator created. God so humbled, enclosed in the womb of of a poor young girl. Crying out, Catherine of Siena says, God, God, you are crazy. And with inflamed desire, we'll come back to that, with inflamed desire, Catherine of Siena says, I go searching for who this young woman is, who joined the lover to the beloved, looking at her from her head down to her feet. So the more I look at her, the more she gives me delight. She is pregnant in appearance, and she shows me. Now, Catherine kind of leaves us hanging there. She shows us what? What does Mary show us? She, so, she shows us God in the flesh. Mary shows us through her body God is given flesh. The revelation of the ultimate mystery of the universe comes to us through this woman's body. So let's start unfolding this poem, and then we'll turn to the image of Guadalupe to get some more insights. <clears throat> Creator created. Just in those two words, we have a beautiful summary of Christmas, of the essential mystery of our faith, the incarnation. We have this stunning, stunning belief as Christians that the Creator took on the form of a creature. The Creator was created. Of course, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, from all eternity existed. He's an eternal person. But his human nature was created in the womb of this young girl from Nazareth. Creator created. God so humbled. You know, God could have come to us in all his majesty, but he came to us in all his humility. What does the birth of God's son in a stinky manger as a helpless babe tell us? If not, God is not threatening. God comes among us as one of us. In fact, he comes among us as a helpless babe so that we would not fear to draw close to him. All of this is revealed through Mary. Creator created, God so humbled, enclosed in the womb of a poor young girl. Catherine of Siena reflecting on this reality that the one whom all the heavens cannot contain came to dwell in the womb of this young girl. She, she exclaims, she's crying out, God, you are crazy. <laughs> what kind of crazy God does this? What kind of crazy God comes among us in the flesh, born of a woman as a helpless babe? What kind of God does this? This must be a crazy God. Pope Benedict speaks of God's crazy love for us, of God's mad eros. I love that expression from Pope Benedict. God's crazy love, his mad eros. Pope Benedict goes on to say, eros is the love that draws the beloved out of himself to find his lover, to find his lover, to come to his lover, to rescue his lover, to take his lover to himself. And he says, is there many, any more mad eros than the love of the Son of God that compelled him to come from heaven to earth, to be born in the womb of this virgin, 
to be raised in a family, to die on a cross, and to draw to himself the beloved. This is the mystery that Mary's body reveals. And so Catherine of Siena says, with inflamed desire. <laughs> what is this inflamed desire? We should be reflecting on this mad eros of God, the, the crazy love of God for us. We should be inflamed with desire ourselves to go in search of him, right? Christ came to set the world on fire. Pope Benedict says, the problem with so many Christians today is we're afraid to burn. We're afraid to get close to this fire. We're afraid to let this fire in. Catherine of Siena is saying, with inflamed desire, I go searching for who this young woman is. Who is this woman named Mary? That's what we're after in this little mini course. Who is she really? She's clothed with the sun. <laughs> Mary is a blazing fireball of love. This woman is wild with the love of God. And she wants to share this mad, crazy, wild love with us. But we must go in search of her. Like Catherine of Siena, with inflamed desire, Catherine says, I go searching for who this young woman is, who joined the lover to the beloved. If we can understand all of Christianity as a wedding feast, as a, as a great marriage, that God wants to marry us. You've heard me say many, many times, this is the whole Bible in five words. God wants to marry us. Where does the marriage take place? Where does the marriage between heaven and earth take place, between divinity and humanity? If not in the womb of this woman. This is where humanity and divinity are wed. And so the fathers of the church spoke of Mary's womb as the bridal chamber where the marriage of heaven and earth is consummated. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out, time out. Mary's womb is a bridal chamber. Not just any bridal chamber, it's the bridal chamber. It's the place where the mystical marriage of heaven and earth is brought to fulfillment. My brothers and sisters, if we enter into this mystery, we will encounter who Mary is, and it will shatter all those hyper-pious ideas of, of, of a disembodied Mary, of, a, of, a, of a, a, a woman who is disconnected from, from the real things of life or from the real desires of humanity. No, 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 no. Mary is the fulfillment of all humanity. And this means she is also the fulfillment of human sexuality. For it was her sexuality, and by that I mean her femininity, that gave flesh to God. It was her yes as a bride to the eternal bridegroom that brought forth Christ in the flesh. So let us go with inflamed desire in search of who this woman really is. Who is this woman who joined the lover to the beloved? Catherine of Siena asks. Looking at her from her head down to her feet. And that's what we're going to do in looking at the tilma. We're going to look from her head down to her feet so that the more I look at her, the more she gives me delight. We must allow the beauty of Mary to delight us in the holiest, most sacred, pure way. We look at Mary from her head down to her feet. We pray with purity of heart. And what will we see in looking at Mary with purity of heart? Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. This is theology of the body in its very essence. For John Paul II says, the body, and only the body, is capable of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. The body, and only the body, is capable of revealing the divine mystery to us. This is the theology of Mary's body. Mary's body reveals the Word made flesh. Mary's body gives flesh to God. Mary's body is at the epicenter, then, 
of theology of the body because her body gives the body theology. Her body, wait, no, 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 let me go the other way. Her body gave flesh to theology. That's what I'm trying to say. Her body gave flesh to God. Her body reveals the divine mystery. So the more I look at her, the more she gives me delight, says Catherine of Siena. She's pregnant in appearance. The image of Guadalupe is pregnant in appearance, and we'll unfold what that means. And in this pregnant woman, she shows me, she shows me the mystery of God and the mystery of humanity. Catherine of Siena, pray for us as we try to enter into these mysteries. So, with that poem in mind, let's begin taking a look at the tilma, right? And we want to look at the tilma from head to foot, just as Catherine of Siena invites us to do. Of course, we're not going to be doing it all today. I'm going to be wrapping up here in about 15 or 20 minutes or so, and uh, we'll continue with part two tomorrow. But we are going to begin to look at what this tilma reveals to us about the mystery of Mary. Let me give you a little history here about the, uh, the whole apparition at Guadalupe. December 12th is the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And for the Aztec Indians in Mexico 500 years ago, December 12th, well, back up, of course, we have the whole reality of the Spanish coming in right, to, to, at the best interpretation, evangelize, but we have to reckon with the horror of the conquest that took place when Spain came to Mexico. And December 12th, on the Julian calendar, was the winter solstice. The Aztecs believed that when the sun was at its lowest point in the sky, and it was the darkest day of the earth, right, they believed that this was a cosmic sign that the sun god was losing his battle. So Mary appears clothed in the sun to the Aztecs. This has great, great significance for their own understanding of the world. The tilma is a codex. In other words, this tilma is full of symbols that don't make sense to us as 21st century, you know, people. But to the Aztecs, this tilma was full of symbols that spoke their language. And this codex, the the hidden symbols in this tilma, the codex, the, the language of the tilma, it untwists the lies of the Aztec culture. The Aztec culture, much like our own culture today, was a culture of death. And much like our culture today, the Aztecs had very graphic art depicting the body in all sorts of distortions, depicting graphic portrayals of death and graphic portrayals of sex. Not so unsimilar to our own world today. The tilma comes into that scene 500 years ago and untwists or untwists what sin had twisted up in their own culture of the image, you could say. The Aztecs much like our world today, was a culture of the image. So it's, it shows the tilma in untwisting these distortions in the culture, it shows the true victory of the true God. The, the Aztecs saw the sun and the moon as deities that were kind of battling it out, right? And so the woman clothed in the sun with the moon under her feet spoke right into the cosmology of the Aztecs. And it showed the Aztecs true worship. We're going to unfold how and why it does that. The tilma also showed the Aztecs the ultimate meaning of the body. It's not death. Theirs was a culture of death. The ultimate meaning of the body was life. Life Life-givingness. Indeed, divine life. This is what the tilma reveals. The final story of the body is not death. The final story is is not darkness for the body. The final story of the body is the participation in divine life. Again, this is what Mary's body reveals to us. Her body was filled full with the fullness of the divine life. 
And so Mary in her body shows us the destiny of our bodies, not death, but life, divine life. We are to be, all of us, impregnated with divine life. This is what the theology of the body teaches us. Not only does God love us, not only does God want to marry us, God wants to fill his bride with divine life. In the tilma, the woman of the tilma is pregnant. Mary is full of this divine life. And I'll show you in just a moment how the symbols of the tilma indicate this to us. <clears throat> First of all, Mary comes, uh, I don't know if you can, how well you can see that image, but Mary comes as a, I hope I say this correctly, a mestiza. Mestiza, it's M-E-S-T-I-Z-A. And that means she's part Spanish and part Aztec. What's being said here? Part Spanish and part Aztec. Well, part of the horror of the Spanish conquest of Mexico was pillage and rape. And there were lots of these mestiza children who were mixed race, part Spanish and part Aztec. And it spoke a great shame to the Aztec people. It spoke of a deep wound in the Aztec people that they had been conquered, pillaged, and tragically raped. These mestiza were a, a mark of shame. And Mary appearing as a mestiza is showing us that she is not afraid of any human shame. She is not afraid of any human tragedy. She comes with her son right into the midst of our broken, wounded humanity, right into the midst of our shame to heal, to restore, to bring light. And that light is Christ. Christ is the Redeemer, but Mary is the one who brings the Redeemer to us. Christ is our healing, but Mary is the one who has fully received that healing. So in Mary, the Mestiza, what we see is the full healing and restoration of humanity's sexual brokenness. This is good news. This is good news. What are the wounds? What are the sexual wounds in your own family history? What are the sexual wounds in your own personal history? What are the most shameful things in your, life that, in your lives that you think, God could never come close to me, Mary could never come close to this, this could never be redeemed, this could never be healed? Ho, ho, ho. We have not understood Christianity if we think that way. The tilma reveals to us this woman who comes with the Savior to reveal this deep healing of our deepest sexual brokenness and our deepest sexual shame. So let's take uh, another look. We're going to go, we're going to follow Catherine of Siena, right, who says we want to gaze on her from her head down to her feet. So let's take a look first at her head. We see on her head first this, this uh, outer garment, right, this outer garment, which is teal and covered in stars. What does that mean, teal and covered in stars? The, the teal of the color in the Aztec Codex was a symbol of the heavens, reinforced, of course, by all of the stars on the garment, right? That's a symbol of the heavens. The interior garment, that kind of peach or tan color, that interior garment is a sign of earth. And look at the bottom. We're going from her head down to her feet. There is an angel, kind of an eagle-like angel, who in one hand is holding the, the heaven-colored garment, and in the other hand is holding the earth-colored garment. The angel is holding the two together. And we could even see in that angel a kind of representation of Gabriel, who comes to the woman to join heaven and earth together in her womb. This is what's happening in Mary, the marriage of heaven and earth. So that's the first thing we see in looking from her head down to her feet. Now let's look at her hair. The part of her hair in the Aztec culture was a symbol of virginity, a symbol of virginity. When they looked at her hair, this is how the virgins in the, of the Aztecs wore their hair to indicate 
that they were virgins. Now, this ribbon here over her womb is a symbol that she is pregnant. The Aztec women would wear a ribbon like this over their womb when they were pregnant. I don't know if you can see it. I'll try to get as close as I can. But under the ribbon, there is a four-petaled flower. And that four-petaled flower was a symbol of divinity. So when the Aztecs looked at the tilma, what they saw, virgin, pregnant, with God. Whoa! Time out. Virgin, pregnant, with God. How did this happen? How can a virgin be pregnant? And how can a virgin be pregnant with God? And what does this mean? If you, like me, were raised with a hyper-pious concept of Mary, you certainly have a hyper-pious concept of her virginity. And we tend to think Mary's virginity is a negation of sexuality. That she didn't conceive Christ in the normal way because, you know, in the final analysis, sex is bad and dirty and tainted and, 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 and Mary could have none of that. Well, it is true that Mary is a virgin. She never had sexual relations with Joseph. This is what we believe as Catholics. But that is not a negation of sexuality. It is the fulfillment of sexuality. Why? Here's why. Okay, we got to go back to the whole biblical story to understand what it means that Mary is the virgin pregnant with God and what, it, what the significance of her virginity is. So the Bible begins with the marriage of man and woman. Throughout the Old Testament, God speaks of his love for his people as the love of a husband for his bride. In the New Testament, the love of that eternal bridegroom is literally embodied in the womb of the virgin Mary. Skip to the end of the story. The book of Revelation describes heaven. How? As an eternal marriage. These two bookends of the Bible, the marriage of man and woman and the marriage of God and humanity, frame the whole story. And we learn that the whole purpose of the marriage of man and woman that begins the Bible is to point us to the marriage of Christ and the church that ends the Bible. Remember, Christ says, in the resurrection we're no longer given in marriage. Why? We're no longer given in marriage in the resurrection because you no longer need a sign to point you to heaven when you're in heaven. The whole reason God made us male and female and called the two to become one flesh, St. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, this is a great mystery and it refers to Christ and the church. This is a great mystery and it refers to Christ's marriage to the church. When Christ's marriage is consummated in eternity, the marriage of man and woman, the sign of the ultimate reality, gives way to the ultimate reality. What's happening in the virginity of Mary, in the virginal marriage of Joseph and Mary? We have to understand why Christ calls some to remain celibate for the sake of of the kingdom of heaven. What is celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of heaven? Well, we go to our frame. We go to the two bookends of the Bible. Which marriage, the marriage of man and woman that starts the Bible, or the marriage of Christ and the church that ends the Bible, which one of these two marriages is the ultimate fulfillment of eros, of our longing for love, of our longing for an infinite love, a love that never dies, a love that lasts forever? It's the eternal marriage that is the fulfillment of all those deep yearnings and desires of our hearts for love and union. That eternal marriage is our destiny. Why does Christ call some to be celibate? For the sake of the kingdom of heaven, for the sake of this marriage. In other words, Christian celibacy, Christian virginity, skips the earthly sign of marriage to devote all of human longing to the ultimate marriage, the ultimate union. In this way, Christian virginity properly understood is not a negation of sexuality. It's the ultimate purpose and fulfillment of sexuality. What is the marriage of the Lamb? I think it's unfortunate 
that in the Christian tradition, we have defined this vocation, celibacy, with that word celibacy, because it's a negative word. It tells us what they're not doing. What has the consecrated celibate person embraced? The consecrated celibate person has embraced the marriage of eternity, the marriage of the Lamb. If we want to talk about sexual orientation, that's a buzzword in our world today, right? If we want to talk about sexual orientation, then Mary teaches us that the ultimate orientation of human sexuality is not towards anything on this earth. The ultimate orientation of human sexuality is towards something infinite, towards something eternal. This young woman was approached by an angel with a marriage proposal. St. Louis de Montfort says that the angel Gabriel came to Mary and came to woo her heart to give her yes to this divine marriage proposal. And Mary, in giving her yes, God the Eternal Father poured out a cup. This is a, a, a line in, in Louis de Montfort's True Devotion. Poured out a cup of divine ambrosial nectar on this mystical rose. Mary is the mystical rose who opens her inner mystery, the mystery of her feminine body, to the coming of the Holy Spirit. This divine love impregnates her. This divine love virginally makes her fruitful. And so Mary is participating, even here on planet Earth, in the eternal marriage. Why didn't she have sexual relations with Joseph? Well, <laughs> she's already participating in the eternal union. Sexual union with Joseph would have been a step backwards, right? Ma earthly marriage takes us back to the beginning. But Mary is participating even here in planet Earth. She's participating in the heavenly marriage. So instead of stepping backwards with Joseph to earthly sexual union, Mary grabs Joseph by the hand and says, come with me to the eternal reality. Joseph and Mary knew a virginal intimacy, a virginal union in their, in their love that is beyond anything we can dare to dream, think, or imagine. Only a hyper-pious, fearful, uh, uh, and puritanical vision of things could interpret Mary's virginity as a negation of sexuality rather than the fulfillment of sexuality. Virginity in the Christian sense does not mean the absence of union. It means the fullness of union. But here, just as Jesus says, we have to distinguish between the wise and the unwise virgins, right? What's the difference in the parable between the wise and the unwise virgins? The unwise virgins have no oil for their lamps. In other words, their hearts are not burning. Their lamps are not lit. The wise virgins, their hearts are on fire. <laughs> and now, you tell me, is she a wise virgin or an unwise virgin? This woman is on fire. That girl is on fire! <laughs> This girl's on fire, folks. This girl is on fire with the eternal love of God. She is a blazing fireball of divine love. She is the first to catch the fire that Christ came to cast on the earth. She caught it. She is blazing. She is on fire. That's what all these rays are. The woman clothed with the sun. What's the sun? What does it mean to be clothed with the sun? The sun is a blazing fireball in the sky. I mean, look at the comparison. Look at what we're saying when we say she's clothed with the sun. Imagine you were around a campfire that was so hot you had to stand like 10 feet back. Okay, imagine you're around a campfire so blazing hot you have to stand 100 yards back so you don't get burned. Amazing, um, imagine a fireball so amazingly hot that you had to stand a mile away from it not to get hurt. Okay, 
Now, imagine, imagine a blazing fireball so hot that you have to be 93 million miles away from it so as not to be charred to a crisp. We're saying this woman entered that fire. We're also saying that fire entered that woman. Christ came to cast fire upon the, wor the world, to set the earth on fire, and Mary's the first to give her yes. If we get close to Mary, be prepared to burn. Be prepared to burn with the fire of divine love. My brothers and sisters, this is just scratching the surface of the surface of the mystery that is revealed through this tilma. We're going to have three more sessions this week, but I urge you, if you are enjoying what you're learning here and you see the significance of it for your life and you see how important this is to get a proper understanding of Mary in order to have a proper understanding of who Jesus is, in order to have a proper understanding of our whole faith and our whole lives, and if you're beginning to see, maybe catching a glimpse of how Mary can enter into the heart of our families, our sexual wounds, our fears, our places of shame, where we need healing the most. If you want to learn more, I urge you, come with me to Mexico City this December. The core project, my ministry, is leading a pilgrimage December 8th to December 13th. Now notice the dates, December 8th is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. December 13th, right, what comes before that? December 12th, we will be in Mexico City on the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. From December 8th to December 13th, we are going to Mexico City. And what I'm just scratching the surface here on trying to unfold some of these mysteries, we're gonna dive head first into this glorious ocean of God's love revealed in Mary. If you want to learn more about this pilgrimage and you want to join us, please do. You can go to coreproject.com. That's C-O-R, C-O-R project.com forward slash Mexico. We have only a limited number of spots at the current price. Uh, we have a certain block of hotel rooms for our pilgrims. And once that block of hotel rooms fills up, which it will very soon, then the, the price is going to go up. Uh, to because we have another block that we have to get. So at the at the the limited uh, pr, uh, excuse me the limited number of rooms we have at the current price. If this is of interest to you, please prayerfully consider coming. Maybe Mary wants you to come on this pilgrimage. Put that in her womb. Put that intention. You might be saying, "Oh, I don't have the money. What's that going to cost? That's going to cost like well, I can tell you what's going to cost. It's going to cost seven. $1,800 or something like that. Maybe, yeah, $1,799, I think. If you don't have that money and Mary wants you to come, put that intention in her womb. Say, Mary, if you want me to be there, you're going to have to open the doors. She's a woman of miracles. I think she's got some, you know, some in to the big guy up there. Put it in her womb and say, Mary, if you want me to go on this pilgrimage, open the doors and bring this to birth. Again, you can learn more, coreproject, C-O-R-project.com forward slash Mexico. Also, if you live in the Mexico City area, we can uh, work an arrangement with you. You might not need the lodging. We can give you a discounted rate just to come on the pilgrimage with us during the day. There's going to be catechesis throughout the day from yours truly as we go to these holy sites. Of course, we're going to visit the Tilma, but we're going to go to holy sites all around Mexico City to bathe ourselves in the Catholic culture there and to learn this whole miracle that happened 500 years ago and what it has to say to us today, most importantly. Many people believe, John Paul II himself believed, that the mystery revealed on Tepeyac Hill 500 years ago only has begun to have its impact in the world, that the best is yet to come, that the tilma has a word for us today about the new evangelization and about overcoming the culture of death we live in here and building a civilization of love and a culture of life. We're going to be diving head first into these mysteries on this pilgrimage. I want to give a shout out to some people who've been joining us. 
Uh, hello, Trish Caps. I so wish I could travel with you to Mexico, but can't, so please post videos of this pilgrimage. Uh, we will do what we can to pass on what we learn to, to all the followers. Uh, Steve Lorna Finley, great prayer. Uh, thank you. You're welcome, Steve. Thanks for joining us on this live broadcast. Kaz Creighton, uh, please say there's a book. <laughs> please say there's a book. Well, uh, I have written a great deal about the Blessed Mother. Um, you might want to look at my book, Heaven's Song, and in some of the courses or the next couple of days, we'll, we'll take a look at what I've written in my book, Heaven's Song, about the Blessed Mother. I'd also recommend this book to you by Carl Anderson and Edward Chavez on Our Lady of Guadalupe. It's called Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mother of the Civilization of Love. I take a look at that book. You can get it at Amazon or wherever you get your books. I want to say hi to Lena Maria Correa from Naples, Florida, St. William Youth Ministry. Bless you. Thanks for joining the live broadcast here. Ali Yokwe Herald. I hope I said that correctly. I can't wait to learn more. Yes, please do. Would love to have you join us. Angelo Casimiro. I hope I said that correctly. Great job, Christopher. Looking forward to your upcoming teachings. Yes, please join me throughout the week and share this link with friends and family. Get the word out about this little mini course we're doing on the theology of Mary's body as illuminated for us through the tilma. Spread the link. Join me tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday at this same, as they say, same bat time, same bat channel. My Facebook page, 1 o'clock Eastern time. I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow, the next day, and the next day. And spread the word. Let's get the good news out about Mary's yes to that divine love. Why don't we close with a prayer? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mary, you are our mama. You're not a blue plaster statue. You are a real woman with flesh and blood. And you long to draw us to your heart. You long to draw us to your motherly nourishment. You long to take us into yourself and nourish us with that spiritual umbilical cord. Let your immaculate blood through, flow through our veins through the mystery of Christ. If Jesus is our brother, then Mary, you are our mother. And if we are to follow Jesus, the per first place Jesus went is right into the mystery of your womb. So Mary, we want to place ourselves there, enclosed in your womb. We want to be nourished by you, just as Jesus was. We want to encounter Christ in you. We want to see the mystery of God revealed through your body, Mary. And that mystery is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, thank you. Thank you for the divine life you've won for us. Thank you for the redemption you've won for us. And thank you for showing its fullness to us in Mary. And thank you, Jesus that from the cross you gave us your mother and taught us to behold our mother. That's what we want to do in this little mini course. We want to follow the words of Jesus and behold our mother. And so we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. The Lord is in you. Blessed is the womb that bore him. Blessed are the breasts from which he nursed, as scripture says. Hail Mary. Thank you, thank you, Mary, Mother of God, spotless bride, bride of love eternal. Pray for us right now and at the hour of our death that we would enter into these glorious mysteries that God wants to marry us and fill us with eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. Spread the video, uh, get it out to friends and family, and I'll see you tomorrow at this same time, 1 o'clock Eastern. Peace, blessings.